presentation, let's say. Uh, I've been playing with this telescope uh, virtually, of course, because uh, when you ask for observation on Chandra, you have to write proposal and say what you didn't want to do, and then receive the data, and then you look at the data, and then you try to work something out and you write papers. Okay, that's how it works. So, first, let's start with the beginning. Okay, uh, for all the people who are, don't know me, I'm uh, Jean-Paul Knaier, I'm director of the Astro uh, Laboratory of Astrophysics on campus here, and also director of the EPFN Space Center. Um, so a busy life in many things, and so today I'm here to talk about Chandra. So we do something quite straight. First, we talk about X-rays because Chandra is about X-rays observation of the sky. So we want to know what X-rays is. Then we talk about the Chandra mission. You know, what, what is Chandra? What is this telescope? And then we have a you know, quite quick glimpse of what has been observed with Chandra in the universe. Um, Chandra has been up there during 20 years, so I cannot you know, summarize everything in, in such a few talk, so only focus on some particular aspect of the Chandra mission. So what is the X-rays? I guess you all know about um, more X-ray detectors. When you go to the airport, you will scan, your stuff is scanned, um, maybe you know, somebody like this is found in your pocket, so that could be problematic of course. Um, and if you go to the hospital, you know, you take X-ray of your body to see if there's something broken. Okay. And uh, so that's something everybody knows about X-ray. You have X-ray sources in the universe. And why you don't see them well from the ground is because you have the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is blocking the X-rays. So X-rays absorb at the atmosphere, so basically from the ground you cannot observe the X-ray sky um, because you, know, you have the atmosphere. So the only way to go and see the X-ray sky is basically launch a test. Why X-rays? So X-rays, as you know, at least for those who do in physics, are photons that have higher energy than optical and UV light. Right? So that means those are very energetic, energetic photons. So if they're energetic photons, that means they come from processes in the universe that are kind of you know, high energy or violent uh, processes. So X-ray will trace high temperature plasma, for example, or they can trace also relativistic particles that are interacting with the strong magnetic field. The first account in the human history of possible X-rays were kind of linked to the detection of a supernova or a very <coughs> bright and transient star in, in the sky. That's what you can see with this picture. So we drawn in 1572, so quite a long time ago, by Tycho Bright, who basically identified one bright object, which I guess is uh, the object high, which is a very bright star. So why I say it's linked to X-rays? Well, if you look at the sky in optical, that's what you see today. You don't see anymore that very bright star because it disappeared. It was a supernova. The supernova typically lasts one week, maybe 10 days. So it's very bright during 10 days and then it's, it's faded because it has consumed all um, the hydrogen and carbon. So it's basically, you know, uh, have no emission. But if you do the same observation in X-rays, that's what you see. What you see here is the remnant of the supernova explosion. When you have a supernova explosion, you're going to produce a lot of particles, high energetic particles, and these high energetic particles will interact with the medium. And those will produce X-rays. And that's basically what you see here. So these things are quite big in the sky. 
and set the fuel up in different size. And if you had no X-ray, you could not see that. So it's very interesting because they allow you to study things that otherwise you wouldn't see by looking in the optical wavelengths. So Chandra is not the first X-ray The X-rays, of course, you've been discovered uh, you know, in labs before sending stuff in space. And even before sending stuff in space, we've been uh, putting X-ray detectors on balloons. And those were first launched in 63 and 65. You had to wait a couple more years to have, uh, you know, with also the ability to send spacecraft uh, up in the orbits. Uh, the first X ray satellite, the Uru satellite in 1970, uh, the first imaging X ray satellite, uh, Einstein Observatory. Then there was a famous one, which is the Rosat satellite, uh, the German Russian uh, Observatory, also in x rays. And only uh, 20 years ago, the Chandra satellite. Uh, in the same year, we have also the XMM Newton satellite, a uh, satellite from the ESA that has been launched, and which has very similar properties uh, than uh, Chandra. Some better things you can do with Chandra, some better things you can do with XMM. There's been a, a more recent new star uh, telescope that is launched in 2012, and this year, in June, I don't know exactly the date, I mean, people say 21st of June, uh, there's going to be a new X-ray satellite to be launched, Erosita, that's again a German Soviet uh, Russian satellite. Uh, satellite. Okay, so you see Chandra is not alone in the sky, and, uh, and uh, you know, some are not working anymore, like Uru and Stein, but both Chandra and Titan and Ustar are up and running and looking at the sky. So what Chandra looks like? It looks like this telescope here. Um, so some numbers. It's 14 meter in length. It's about 5 ton, just the satellite here. And it costs about 1.6 billion dollars. Um, so for a satellite that is 20 years you know, operating in Norway, that's not very expensive, um, if you think about it. Um, it's called the NASA Great Observatory. Uh, NASA has a you know, number of great, observation, great observatories. Uh, Hubble is one of them. Chandra is another one. Fermi. Uh, which is a, a, a gamma ray uh, mission, is another uh, one. Spitzer, an infrared telescope, is another NASA great observatory. So, those great observatories are basically producing a lot of science and data. So, what we see here, of course, you have the solar panel. Here, you have the entry of the telescope. And over there, you have the sensors, the cameras. And we're going to see why it's so long. You know, if you think of an you know, um, optical telescope, usually you try to make it as compact as possible. But for X-ray, it's basically impossible. Why that? If you take X-rays, that's the yellow light here trying to, to show to you. It's moving too fast. Anyway. Um, if it goes straight onto a mirror, like an optical mirror, we just go through the mirror. Okay. So you need to have a specific mirror, which has this side, this side shape. It's a, no, it's a number of you know, hyperbolic surface collimated on you know, circular view, and they basically focus the X-ray light by making small deflection angles of the X-ray line. Okay, so that means the focal length of that telescope is very long. And that's why X-ray telescopes have to be very long in, in size. And on, on the other part of the telescope, basically, you have your sensor. This is like the main part of the satellite, the bus, what we call the bus, the channel X-ray observatory. Uh, and it's being tested here. And in terms of vibration. Here is another picture of the mirror. So you see this concentric 
annulus, and, and we have basically a reflection extra light we come here, and we be reflected uh, around these different rings of mirrors.
putting a lot of energy uh, through uh, high energy particle in the uh, surrounding medium. So what you see is the medium that is excited by X-ray and that is reading some uh, light in X-ray too. What you see here is uh, M51, it's a very large spiral galaxy and you can detect there X-ray stars, so stars that emit in X-rays, such like neutron star, uh, and also the interstellar medium, which is also producing um, X-ray photons. Here, it's called the Perseus cluster. It's a massive cluster of galaxies, and at the center, you have an engine we call the lattice galaxy, that is producing also a lot of X-rays. Eta Carina is also uh, another star that has exploded. And here is planetary nebula, again, that's the remnant of an explosion of a star. So you see, what you can basically detect are things that are, have a lot of energy uh, in the universe. So, Let's go into more detail on three different observations that have kind of you know, re-evolutionized X-ray astronomy. The first one is in our galaxy. It's the remnant of a supernova. So a remnant of a supernova is what is remaining of an explosion of a star. What you see here is a picture taken from Einstein Observatory. As I said in the beginning, it was the first imaging X-ray telescope. When you see here, each point records the arrival of an X-ray photon. So when you do X-ray astronomy, you basically count the X-ray photons <coughs> one by one. Okay? So what you see here, it's each dot corresponds to one X-ray photon coming from uh, the, the, the remnant here. So this picture is more than 20 years old, maybe 25 years old. This picture here is the first light of the channel observation. That was the, you know, taking advantage of um, you know, the opening of the telescope and looking at a very famous object. That's your picture. So that's why you see here. But because you have so many photons with X-ray, because you have a much core from the telescope, here what is represented is not anymore each photon collected by the spec I mean by the telescope, but the density of photons. Okay, which then it's you know, much higher than in this case here, where you basically count photons one by one. So we it basically demonstrated that you can do a lot of uh, uh, science with, with Chandra. <coughs> Chandra not only does imaging, it does spectroscopy. So it, does, it means you're measuring not only the X-ray photons, but you're measuring also the energy of the photons. And you're measuring it to a relatively good level, I mean certainly 100 times better than uh, Einstein was uh, doing before. So that means if you're sensitive to the wavelengths or to the energy of the photons, you can link the energy to um, what I call emission lines, okay, that are basically linked to, um, to the calcium or the sulfur on the silicon, on the iron, coming from uh, the mirror. So basically, with Chandra and with the spectrograph on board in Chandra, you can trace what are the different elements that are produced in the interstellar medium following the remnant of the explosion of all that super. Next object. A little further away, it's what we call the active galactic nuclei. So what we have here is the term active galactic, so means 
you know, galaxy. Nuclei means at the center of a galaxy. So what do we have at the center of a galaxy? Do you know? A black hole. So basically an AGN, an active galactic nuclei, is a black hole that is doing something. Okay? It's active. So it's emit lights and we can basically trace its emission. And Shenra is very good in doing that. Again, this is one of the first images taken by Chandra. And that's an image of what we call the luminous quasar. <coughs> luminous quasar are basically active galactic nuclei. They are black hole at the center, supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And they're quasar in the sense that they're quasi-stellar and they're emitting light at basically all wavelengths. Um, sometimes not in radio, but all, all the other wavelengths like optical, UV, X-ray, gamma ray. The interesting story of this image is that because it was the first one, there was this detection here that people thought first that well, that was linked to the central image of the black hole and not something not exactly uh, the black hole. So they were thinking that you know, there was some distortion in the optics of Chandra that made, you know, if you look at something punctual, I mean something you know, very small, you have a defect, uh, which you see here, which is just you know, another extended image of, of, of the central image. But in fact, that was true. That is, it's, this is not linked directly to the agent, and it's not a default of the optics of the telescope. What we see here, it's the jet, what we call the jet of the, of the black hole. Okay. So a black hole is active when you have mass falling onto the black hole. To make mass falling onto the black hole, you need to have what we call an accretion disk. So you have a disk in which matter gets closer and closer to the black hole. And when it falls onto the black hole, a fraction of that mass will produce light. And just because of the question of symmetry, that light and, and, and the particle uh, involved of linked to the light have to go somewhere. But because of the disk, they cannot go in the disk. They, have, they go basically perpendicular to the disk and they are forming two jets, one on, on, on the top part and one on the bottom part. Usually you can, again by a question of symmetry, you only see one jet because the other one is behind your object and because of the disk that is rotating uh, and is around uh, your, your black hole, uh, it also blocks the light of things that are on the other side. So that was a very good uh, first measurement of the X-ray emission coming from the jet. That has been observed in many of uh, the other supermassive black hole <coughs> One of them is being quite famous recently, is the A87 galaxy on which we have a black hole. Does it tell you something, A87? Some recent news? Well, A87 was detected uh, recently with the Event Horizon Telescope, which made basically the first picture of a black hole. Right. So, what we see, no? that's, that, that's the picture coming from the Event Horizon Telescope. That's not in X-ray, that has been observed in millimeter wavelengths, and what we see or don't see is a black, black hole, because the black hole is at the center and it's black. <coughs> it's a black hole. What we see around it is the matter falling onto the black hole and being excited and being at a given temperature that is radius at millimeter wavelengths. So what you see here, it's not really a black hole, it's just the light of stuff 
excited for around the black hole. But that gives you a good idea of the size of the black hole because you know, it should be smaller than, than this region. And what you see here, you have no light here, so basically it'll give you the size more or less of the black hole. And in perspective, um, here this point of the sun and the orbit of Pluto. So it tells you it's a super massive black hole, really, really big. You don't want to be too close to it. Last point. Chandra has been also observing very large scales in the universe. And the, the stuff that is uh, very good at is looking at cluster of galaxies. And basically when I was using Chandra, I was really to look at cluster of galaxies. Let's take the topic I'm interested in. So why cluster of galaxies are so interesting? Well, because they have a lot of dark matter. Dark matter in the universe is probably something like 80% of the total mass of the universe. The problem is that we don't know exactly where it's located. So, dark matter has been detected or you know, deduced, say, uh, <coughs> of its presence back in the 1933 or so. So quite a long time ago. By comparing the total mass uh, measured by the dynamical measurement compared to you know how much star you have in the cluster. So we first made this measurement with the coma cluster, so relatively nearby cluster, and people found that there was more than 100 times more mass than the mass corresponding to the stars you see in the cluster. What we see here is a numerical simulation image of the dark matter distribution in the universe. So what we see, at, so we see filamentary structure, and at the crossing of the filamentary structure, we see you know, more intense light, which correspond to cluster of galaxies. So with the numerical simulation, if you put some from scratch, you know, dark matter, gas, baryons, you know, normal matter, you end up forming this kind of network of filaments, and then crossing of the filaments, you're finding you're finding clusters. Those things are evolving with time, and the more time passing, the cluster gets larger and larger because they will accumulate mass coming from the filaments. So basically, mass are in the filament, most of the mass in the beginning are in the filaments, and the mass go linearly following the filaments, and they basically end up at the center of the cluster. So that means at some point you may have a collision of two big things falling together and making an even bigger object. That's basically what you see in that picture. Okay, let's decode it, right? So, what do we have? We have stars, like this thing is a star from our Milky Way. This bright thing also, okay, that's going. That's a relatively big galaxy, not too far. And what you have here, just thinking of the very bright stuff, yellow stuff, is a collection of galaxies. That's what we call a cluster of galaxies. The blue things here, the blue light, is basically the map of the dark matter traced by the gravitational lensing effect. Okay, I won't explain what it is, but we can discuss uh, a question. Anyway, that's a tool, gravitational lensing is a tool to make dark, dark matter or total mass map. Okay, so where you have galaxies, like over here or like over here, you have a couple of you know, galaxies close together, usually you're finding uh, dark matter mass. It's also usually where you're finding X ray or gas. Okay, because if you have a cluster, it means you have a potential well, 
And if you have some gas, well, the gas will tend to go in at the bottom of the potential well. But at the bottom of the potential well, the density is very high. So that means your gas, whether it's like hydrogen or helium or whatever, falling onto the bottom well of the potential with a high density, it will be heated. So it will get hot. And if it's very hot, then it will radiate in its rays. So what we see here in pink is the X-ray emission. So naively, we should have thought that the X-ray color would be centered on the dark matter, on, on, on the galaxy, and similarly here. Right. But, remember what I said? The mass is falling onto the cluster following the filaments. So in this case, we have two big clusters, you know, kind of following filaments, and basically bound. There is a collision. Why can we say there is a collision? Well, you see here, the edge of the X-ray emission is very sharp. We can compute the density and the pressure of the X-ray gas measured by the X-ray information, and we can deduce effectively there is a shock, a supersonic shock. So what we see, in fact, here is the result of the collision of two clusters, and they've just been passing through, right? And we are basically in a position where they are like that. The X-ray gas is interacting. It's normal matter. If you have uh, two clouds of, of gas particles, little particle, they will interact. So they will be slowing down when they go through each other. The dark matter, as we believe, uh, of what the dark matter particle is, is collisionless. We believe dark matter particle doesn't interact with other particles and with itself. And that's why it's so difficult to detect the nature of the particle of dark matter. So this picture is telling you that there is a real difference between bionic matter, normal matter, gas, you know, hydrogen, protons, etc., and dark matter. And it's probably the best image and the best proof of the existence of dark matter in the universe. And that was done by Chandra. Okay. okay, time is passing on, so let me finish. And just to say that Chandra is still observing, and in principle, if nothing broke, it can observe for many years again. That's true for the XMM Legion satellite. And uh, to look up in the future, there's this new June launch of the Erosita. A space mission that will be also very interesting. It will be a telescope in X-ray that will survey the full sky and not pointed observation like uh, Chandra and XMM are doing. There is also other X-ray mission planned from the Japanese side, and in the longer term, there's going to be even more powerful mission by ESA. Uh, ESA Athena mission is supposed to be launching. 2031. Okay. And Chandra has also a successor in the NASA world. Uh, the name of the, the project is called Lynx. Uh, and we should know this year maybe whether this is a project that's going to be um, flying in the future. Okay. And that's all for tonight. Thank you.